All right, today's speaker is Trisha Bethke. Trisha is the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator at the Morton Arboretum. Trisha, welcome. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Erin, and hello, everybody. There's 151 people, and I wish we were all sitting in a room together, and I was just saying to Erin, the sun's out, so this is a really, really, really good day. So wherever you are, I hope it's sunny. I hope you had a good, healthy, and happy holiday season. Today, we are going to talk about the newest invader in Illinois, and it used to be on the unwanted. It's still on the unwanted. It used to be the not found in Illinois invasive pest, but sadly, as you'll learn, um, right now we do have a positive confirmation of spotted lanternfly. I'll go through all the ins and outs that we went through last fall. It was exciting. It was interesting. It was a little unnerving to know that it, it finally arrived after a number of years. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to do a deep dive into the life cycle. I want you all to come away with a real understanding of um, what this pest is, what we're looking for, and then how can you help, right? How can we all work together and kind of figure out, you know, how to manage this pest because we will be managing it. But let's start out really quickly. I hope you can see it. Erin, if you can't, you'll let me know. Um, my position is the Forest Pest Outreach Coordinator for the state of Illinois. That's me. Uh, if we were all together, I would have a spotted lanternfly headband for you. So next time we get together, definitely I will have them and make sure that we, we share them. This position is funded through the US Department of Agriculture, their Plant Protection Act. So every year I write my own grant. I fund my program. The Morton Arboretum has been my home for almost 16 years now, which is super exciting. I love the Arboretum. Um, my, I'm tasked with providing education and outreach. I conduct forest pest identification trainings. We talk a lot about high-risk pathways. So how do we stop this from moving around? How do we stop it from entering into different counties in Illinois. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And the other thing that we talk a little bit about is safeguarding our system. So we have a protocol, we know how to manage it. We worked with our, our federal and our state partners. And the other thing that I do is I get to hand out a lot of really cool resources like you'll see coming up. Um, and that's a lot of fun for me to be able to be places like the state fair every year, come and see me in conservation world. Um, and, and really connect with people when you're handing them resources. And those resources are tools to help people identify and then uh, report and, and hopefully manage these pests as they come along. I'd like to start out with, with kind of talking about uh, why, you know, if we always kind of think a little bit about, well, this pest is becoming a problem in the United States. Is it a federally regulated pest or is it a state regulated pest? What, what is going on and, and who is responsible for managing these pests? And I'll be honest with you, this, and, and if you've seen a presentation of mine, you definitely know uh, that I, I put this up before because it's a reminder to me that the costs of these invasive pests are borne at the local level. So think about local equals state, right? So we think about insect borers. Insect borers do the most damage, Asian longhorn beetle. Locally, $1.7 billion. When I think of Asian longhorn beetle or emerald ash borer, right? I mean, goodness gracious, we, we, we are still feeling the effects of that 10-year infestation. Um, spotted lanternfly isn't a fly. It's actually a sap feeder. It's a phloem feeder. We'll, we'll explore that together. But knowing specifically, you know, what those costs are and what the impacts are is huge. Think about this on an annual basis, $34.7 billion we spend all across the country uh, managing these pests. So again, uh, knowing, knowing that those costs are significant and thinking about how we can take those management costs and then turn them back into community health costs. So one thing I'd like to do too is also talk a little bit about prevention. With spotted lanternfly, uh, we had an early we have an early detection and a rapid response team. And I'll be honest with you, um, when we found spotted lanternfly, I had to ask myself, how ready were we? And the answer is, we were really ready. 
So if you're looking at this graph over on the lower left-hand side, it says prevention. So the least amount of area infested, the least amount of time, and the least amount of control costs. So the prevention meaning as soon as you find it, you report it, and then we can act on it. Oftentimes these pests come, they're hiding, and that arrow that you see in the center, if I put a time frame on that, that's about five to seven years. And now we're talking about containment and long-term management. And, and I'm hoping that in Illinois, we're gonna be over on the lower left side, that prevention. We're gonna be able to get in there. We're gonna do a little bit of er eradication as you're walking your way up this curve. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going to go on in Cook County this winter and how you can help throughout the state, right? It's, it's winter and we want to be out and we want to be productive. So there's many things that you can do to help all of us. So right coming out of COVID, actually one of the cool things that happened during COVID was there was a real need to train our dogs. We had animals, we have dog sniffing animals and these dogs are phenomenal at getting the scent of an egg mass and then being able to find it. So you're looking at kind of the, the high risk pathways. So those wood pallets, right? Anything that's not heat treated, those wood pallets. Or on the lower left-hand side, marble. They love, fried lantern fly female loves a flat surface that she can run right into and layer eggs. And then transportation. And we know that, that, that I, before it was found, we thought most likely that spotted lanternfly would come in to Illinois via transportation. And while I look at that, over on the right-hand side, you're seeing uh, Illinois all lit up and a little bit, of, little bit of red. Those heavy concentrations of red are high-risk pathways, so those vulnerable points of introduction, Cook County, St. Louis, down in St. Louis, and then over you know, on, the, on the, the upper west side around Davenport, Iowa. So this was a, um, uh, an analysis that uh, the model predicted if we were in Illinois and spotted lanternfly, knowing what they knew in 2015 uh, was going to get to Illinois, how likely would it be to get here? And we now know that it's very likely. Uh, we have over 36,000 miles of roads, 9,000 miles of railroad track. We have 107 airports for public use. Think about people in California. You're flying anything, equipment, materials, whatever, from the East Coast, and you're going to stop in Illinois. You're going to refuel, and then you're going to go to California. Well, something happens during the refueling, or you have to move cargo in and out, and that's infested. That's how these pests get moved around. And then also we have 165, I think. I'll have to double check uh, my numbers this year. Uh, wineries. And so why, why are wineries an issue or a, a high risk or a vulnerable point? Uh, wineries are because, you know, people are coming from outside and there's the, the material, the grapevines that Spotted Lanternfly loves to feed on. So we, we look at industry, we look at our specialty crops, and we try to figure out kind of what what would be the likelihood or the scenario that they would get set up and, and where would that preferred plant material be? And wineries kind of came to the top of the list. So in 2015, we found out about spotted lanternfly. It was found, I think, actually in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Uh, and then we figured out like, well, what are we gonna do? Well, we should do our own survey. So our Kelly Estes was our state survey coordinator. Uh, for the Agricultural Pest Survey Program, uh, put up some traps, and we still trap to this day. So we're always looking at specialty crop trapping and, and getting out and doing some monitoring just so that we can stay ahead of that invasion uh, cycle. But in 2015, we only had a couple of reports of the preferred host, and the preferred host is Tree of Heaven. And when I talk about Tree of Heaven, everybody goes, yay, get rid of that tree it's no good it's really you know invasive uh, but unfortunately tree of heaven is a tree so tree of heaven provides ecosystem services it provides clean air it does water filtration you know i mean it is a tree and there is a lot of it but our federal partners and some of our state partners looked at illinois and said well you don't have a lot of uh host material and those of us that are familiar with trees said, you know what, tree of heaven is everywhere. And we tried to figure out what exactly is everywhere, right? What, what tree of heaven is everywhere? Well, 
We, when we were, um, you know, we were at home for a couple of years, we had an opportunity to get out and, and really test and find out whether or not we actually had a uh, tree of heaven uh, everywhere. And it turns out that we do. So 100% of the counties in Illinois have a record or have a specimen of Tree of Heaven. Right in the center, if you don't know Tree of Heaven, uh, this center, this image, if you were to look up Tree of Heaven, give some, oops, hold on, let me go back. Uh, I think it's on auto. Um, the, the identification, I don't wanna spend too much time identifying it, but right now, so right in the center on the lower right-hand side, you'll see that leaf scar. It's kind of like that big, big smiley face. Um, you probably see these long, narrow uh, stalks or clumps, if you will, of trees that have heavy lenticels, heavy markings on them. So in Illinois, we know that we have transportation pathways. So this is the image of how it originally arrived in the United States, and it came in off of hardscapes. So cement that was going to be uh, laid uh, in a landscape came, it didn't get used and the egg masses were all, those pallets were infested. And in the background, you see a uh, tree of heaven. And so uh, perfect, the host, uh, the, the invasive species found its perfect host, a perfect uh, welcome, if you will. And this is what we see oftentimes, uh, and we see it you know, everywhere. It doesn't necessarily always have to be um, on, um, on a wood pallet, it can be on a rusty metal surface, it can be on a dog kennel, it can be on a crate that's outside, it can be anywhere, a rail car, you name it, trucks that are, are uh, you know, idle for a number of, of months. So this, this past fall in September, uh, it was found in Illinois. And the reason why I put up don't panic, uh, don't panic was the message that we, uh, developed together, and actually it was Scott Shermer, I think that was the real lead on just coming up with this really short, do not panic about this pest. We know where this pest is. Uh, we know what to do, and we don't want to alarm everybody. Uh, what I found was a very small, what I consider to be a small infestation, uh, and, and when hopefully that's where it is, and we'll talk about exactly the site that it is available for everybody to see. Um, uh, it was surprisingly small, probably a year or two years uh, in the making, maybe two, maybe three, uh, because we went back and we actually saw the increased amount of egg masses uh, during, uh, uh, I think it was early November. So, so knowing kind of the, 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 the life stage uh, and the life cycle of this plant is, is super helpful. Messaging is really important. As Erin said, you know, hopefully you're gonna take this information and you are going to provide training to your community and to your volunteers and to the people that you work with. And that's our hope. This is the train the trainer opportunity. So the message is don't panic, so that's great. There's two messages in this uh, presentation, so that is one of them. Don't panic about spotted lantern five. It is on the move, we know it is over on the right-hand side, all the counties that are lit up in blue, those are positive county records. It doesn't mean that the whole county is actually infested. You can start to see if you squint your eyes, there's just like a little tiny uh, kind of a pinkish purple uh, spot and that is just one dead adult that was found. So not a, live, uh, not a live population, but a dead population. So they're trying to track it. And you can see there's one in Michigan, there's a couple in Ohio, there's a couple in Indiana, there's one in Illinois. Our Cook County's all lit up and Cook County is a huge county, uh, but there's a very small population that we found just you know, right now. So we don't know if there, there are more of them. Um, and then that's just uh, an opportunity to kind of take a look geographically where it came in. So when I said it was found in Cook County, it came in on rail, um, Norfolk Southern, think about that. If you look at this, you're looking at, it kind of looks like a, a, a map of somebody's veins or something, but, and I think I've got an arrow, yeah, I do. So right there, you can start to see where the Indiana, Chicago, Indiana, Illinois border is, right? And you start to see where that rail line is coming from. Well, it came right into this huge rail yard in Cook County. 
And we believe that the infested, that the past infestations, the egg masses, if you will, are going to be east. So if we went and we walked back east and we looked around the rail lines, we would hopefully start to see kind of delimit where this uh, species is, where are the egg masses, and then also move west and try to figure out, okay, where else, you know, what other rail yard, big rail yard or holding pen for these rail cars and, and, and trucks too might be. So I thought it was interesting. It did come in off a of rail. It, the models were correct. I think uh, the initial models, if you look right in the center of the state, I think it's I-80, or maybe I think, I'm, I don't know. Um, I-80 might go right through the center and it goes all the way out. Um, we initially thought that that would be the most likely uh, point of entry, but now we know we have something to go on, which is super exciting. It's like a big old like, hunt and we've got all these different clues that are coming together. So we're, we're documenting them and we'll be out uh, this winter and all of this year uh, trying to figure out uh, where, if any, there are other populations. So let's take a step back and take a look at the, uh, the, the life cycle review. I'm gonna to step to the left for just a second and plug my laptop in. It's not that it doesn't have battery, it's just, I think it'll help a little bit on the lighting. Hold on. There, well, there you go, see, <laughs> I'm back. All right, good, so we're gonna do a little bit of the life cycle review. I think this is really important. If anybody's interested in getting a copy of this, a PDF, I'd be happy to provide that to you because there's some good information uh, in the notes sections and I can modify it and you know make it uh, have the notes in on the presentation if you're interested. Just drop a note in the chat and Aaron and I can connect afterwards and get you the information. I love I love this um, this image. Uh, basically what it does is it just walks us through a whole year and it's kind of a roadmap. So if you think about November, December, January, February, March, right? Those are egg masses. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side is that shiny gray patch. That's the waxy coating underneath. Think about sausage links, each little tiny sausage link. And there could be a couple hundred of them have about egg, eight, 35 eggs in them. So they're laid um, and they usually hatch sometime in the spring. So look at May, look at June. Um, this is what we're starting to kind of get our head wrapped around. So if you think about Illinois, we found them in September over on the right-hand side into October, November, December. So right now we're going to be thinking about egg masses and that's what I want you to be thinking about. In the spring after hatching, the spotted lanternfly goes through four different nymphal stages. The nymphs you see right in the center, they're wingless and each molt or each change, if you will, they double in size. Newly hatched nymphs are small. They're about an eighth of an inch. Think about a tick. You have a tick this spring, make sure you know it's really a tick. Uh, the first three instars, mean the changing, are black and white. And then the last one is the red, white with black uh, stripes. The fourth instar is what we most see is around the right-hand side. It's that very tropical looking uh, adult. They begin to emerge in July. I think that that will largely be dependent on temperature. And I think it'll be uh, the warmer it is, probably the earlier the hatch would occur. So if you're in Southern Illinois, that could be a month or two, a month and a half ahead of say potentially Northern Illinois and Northwestern Illinois. Um, they are easily detected. They are large. They're just about the size of a penny. If you think about it, they're highly mobile and they have black abdomens and the females have yellow bands that become really super visible as they mature. Their forewings are gray with black spots and their tips are black with gray veins while their hind, so you see over on the right hand side, they're kind of like that bluish gray. I think this is helpful. I want to make sure that we kind of take a moment to, to really capture what that 12 year or 12 month cycle would look like. The challenge with uh, spotted lanternfly is that as soon as the nymphs start hatching, so the eggs they start hatching, in one life cycle stage, one life cycle, from May all the way up until end of September, beginning of October, probably 
probably not the end of October, probably the beginning of September. So May to September, you could have first instar, second instar, third instar, and adults. And that is the challenge when you're talking about how to manage the species. So if you've got uh, you've got multiple ages and multiple life stages, then your management strategies are going to be different pretty much for most of them. So looking at the difference between the nymphs and the adults, the nymphs feed on sap and they think about like in the spring, right? Think about when all the juices from down below are coming up and they're pulsing out through the, the trunk, throughout to the branches, the twigs, and then the petioles and then the leaves. They are feeding on that, that turgor pressure that the plants uh, uh, create, right? So they, they put that pumping station in action and they have a piercing mouth part. I think I have a good image of it. And they use it to just suck out all of that beautiful sap that's flowing out. Over on the left-hand side, you see that picture that's, I think, I believe on a grapevine. Um, they love grapevines. They are a plant hopper and they love anything that they can hop around on and along. So as an adult, they feed on the twigs and branches and the trunks of woody plants. Although I would say probably not bark feeding per se, but if you think of the tree of heaven and all of those lenticels, those lenticels are just tiny little holes that allow the exchange of not only you know uh, gas, but also fluids. When you've got that piercing mouth part and you can just turn it on. Um, this is it. I think this is fascinating. Um, this is what in, in out east people are seeing. So you can see that the nymphs often they move in groups and they like to to aggregate so they can hang out on the same plant. Um, the group aggregation actually increases with life stages. So the older they get, the bigger they get, the more of them and the more likely they are to stay. The nymphs, so you see the red and the white and the black and then the black and white. The nymphs just are constantly moving. They'll go up in a tree and then they'll fall back down and they run up the tree and they fall back down. The adults tend to stay on the same plant longer, except during the mating and the flighting, flight activity. They often choose a favorite hot tree or a host tree. So think about a healthy tree of heaven, a healthy maple. They go after our healthy trees. Our native borers, our native insects go after our dead and dying trees. They're the decomposers. So look at that. You've got second instar, you've got third instar, and now you've got the fourth instar all hanging out together, multi-generational right there. And that's a challenge, right? That is a real challenge to, to try to figure out. They're fast, they jump around, they've got sticky pads, they can scamper away very quickly. When they're piercing mouth parts, so if you've got a pest that has a piercing mouth part, look at that, right in the center, there it is, just like a big old push pin, just like pierces it, opens up the lenticel and <laughs> all that stuff. Everything that comes in goes out, right? So that's a natural process. So there's oozing on the plant, there's wilting, it stresses the plant. If you see a walnut tree in the middle of the summer and it's yellow and it's flagging and it's kind of like hanging out, it just doesn't look normal, you should have that tree evaluated. Definitely get a binocular, get close to it, look all around that tree and try to figure out, certainly, when it warms up after like over 55 degrees, they generally don't move much when it's, you know, when it's less than 50 degrees. And I think I have a, a I might have a, a good, um, just as a sidebar, we had a cold snap in September of last year. And sure enough, those adults like froze. They, they literally just froze. And so that was a, a weird thing to see. There's dieback. Uh, you can have a loss of yield if you have grapes or if you have stone fruits. Um, there, on the lower right-hand side, there's an uh, image of um, the tree, oftentimes tree of heaven. If people mistake sumac for tree of heaven or tree, you know, vice versa. Um, looking at it, if you see sumac, they'll feed on sumac too. It's not just only tree of heaven. But that yellowing during the growing stage is really important as well. The image on, on this, this grapevine, 
is <laughs> they're so well camouflaged. There's grapes in there. And if you look really closely, you can start to see like the spotted lantern flies in and around. And all they're doing is hanging out and feeding on those really sugary um, grapes. And, and actually not specifically the grapes themselves, but the petiole that's attached, kind of like that idea, the conduit, if you will. Uh, that's what they're using. The spotted lanternfly is a, just a, an annual pest, right? So it spends a tremendous amount of time growing, feeding, growing, feeding, and then mating, and then the female lays their egg, she dies, and the male dies. And that the, the more carbohydrates that they can get in, the more uh, chemical compounds, like think of walnut, think of tree of heaven, there's some unique chemical compound, it's allelopathic, that, that allows those eggs to really increase its viability. So if they're feeding on walnut, they're feeding on tree of heaven, they're feeding on maple in the end of their life, you know what? Their chances are their eggs, their egg masses, their viability of those egg masses are gonna go up from 65 to like probably 80, 90%. I don't know about 90%, but certainly, you know, in the high 80s. So again, it's something to think about, but that piercing mouth part, that, that's it. That's what happens, how it does it. So we know that whatever comes in actually ends up coming out. So the byproduct of all that honeydew, I mean, the, all that feeding is that honeydew. Uh, and I don't have an image here of uh, like a video image, but if you look at it, I think Pennsylvania, the Department of Agriculture has a really good, um, or Penn State Extension probably too, has a real good video of the feeding. And you look at the video and you're kind of trying to figure out like, what am I looking at? What am I seeing? Well, what you're seeing is the flex. So you see these like bright flashes of lights all around. And those bright flashes of light are honeydew. I don't know if you're familiar with aphids. So if there's a heavy feeding uh, from aphids, oftentimes you'll go up to the tree, up to the plant, and you'll see it. And you'll see kind of like this sticky residue on the leaf. And you're like, oh, wow, that? it's all shiny. Uh, that's honeydew, right? And so as honeydew accumulates, it colonizes uh, by sooty mold. Look at that, that's that shiny surface. Uh, so don't just think of it as aphids. Definitely take a look at that plant, take a close look at that plant and try to figure out what is actually causing it. So all of this, uh, the sooty mold reduces the photosynthesis. It can uh, affect the growth of understory plants. It becomes very unsightly. So you're starting to see kind of right around the, the flare of that trunk. After a while, that'll start to really impact the viability of that trunk. So you've got so much black sooty mold on it. You know, the, the air exchanges become very limited and that becomes very stressful. Uh, for that tree and for any plant uh, as well. So looking at the, the behavior, looking at um, host trees, we mentioned black walnut, we mentioned red maple, silver maple is a big one too. Um, we've got uh, vines, grape vines, hops, they like hops, any types of stone fruits. You think about other hosts as well. We've got willow, apple, birch, sycamore, uh, lilac, poplar. Uh, willow is an interesting one because I think that willow is popping up. Think about our riparian systems. Think about how much willow we have in central Illinois, uh, down around kind of a Peoria area. Follow that river and all you've got is just willow and birch. And it really is interesting to me to start to look at the, the you know, dominant species or the, the most uh, dominant species in, in areas, and then try to figure out where that likely connection of potential transportation and then kind of the potential host. Uh, you know, in Northern Illinois, everywhere, we got tree of heaven, but is tree of heaven um, everywhere, like all along the roads? No, it's not. You know, we have a, a bigger problem, I think, with honeysuckle. Uh, than we do with Tree of Heaven, uh, even though, but Tree of Heaven is also a, a tree that nobody looks at and nobody cares about. It's not like you would go and prune your Tree of Heaven ever, uh, but it's also a buffer zone. It's a transition tree, meaning it's going to protect 
uh, the house or the apartment or, or the facility from a road or from a rail or from a marina or something. And so it's that buffer zone uh, that these pests like to hang out. They're not in, they're not a, a, an understory. They're not uh, likely to be found, say, in the middle of a forest, a heavy, you know, um, a heavy, you know, shade, a shady forest, right? They're an edge species. They like to be on the edge of things. So, so that's something that we've begun to realize uh, from our partners out east. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of research going on in APHIS and the Department of Agriculture. So all the state departments of agriculture really have done a phenomenal job. And, and Scott uh, from the Department of Ag, Scott Turner and, and Greg Rensler from APHIS, PPQ, as well as Kelly Estes and Extension, Aaron, you, everybody's been so supportive, very helpful and, and really uh, great communicators. So, you know, it's got a wide host range, probably got over a hundred different types of species. Uh, they'll feed on anything uh, from one area and they go to the other area. Um, I, I think that the, the early instars, the first, you know, kind of as they're young, they're just looking for something that's viable and accessible. And as they get older, uh, they tend to be able to identify kind of a, a more suitable host as the, the older that they get. So one thing that happened, and I don't think I have it here. All right. Um, one, yeah, we can talk about it. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, this, I love this. So this is another roadmap, right? Right. So we got the rail yards. Now we've got we've got a light stage. We've got twelve months. Now we know kind of what mo what may they be feeding on. So in May and June, look at you've got rose, you've got perennials, you've got grapes, you've got tree of heaven. I mean, May and June, like our perennials, man, they're popping out. They're like going crazy if the weather is good. And then they start feeding as adults. Look at that. We've got tree of heaven. We've got black walnut, river birch, sumac. Uh, and you're looking at four months of heavy feeding potential. But what's not there is that fluctuation of nymphs. Right, so the nymphs could be in July, they could be in August, they could be feeding, you know, on different plant materials. So again, very hard to really suss out. Next year, when we have this presentation again, we're going to have a lot more information because we are going to be able to say what's going on in Illinois, what's going on based on our uh, weather patterns, our temperature patterns, our precipitation patterns. Uh, that will really drive timing in which these uh, nymphs are hatching and actually feeding and then mating and dying. So it's interesting, really interesting. Um, how can you help? I mean, I know that I have been talking for a little while, uh, but I know, and I always say this, sounds like a lot of gloom and doom. I'll be honest with you, I am filled with so much hope. I know that you all, we, can work together, we can get out, we can monitor. Because if you monitor your trees, that is the one of the biggest things that you can do other than planting it correctly in the right place, right tree, right place. Um, you can actually improve the long-term survivability of your trees by monitoring them, right? It makes perfect sense to me. The more you look at something, the more you care about something, the more you're interested in something, the longer they're going to live, the, the, the longer you, you'll be able to see something, right? You see a branch that's broken off or it needs pruning or if it looks like it's wilting and it needs water or if it looks like it needs a nutrient, you know, so that monitoring is really going to help. And that's where you can come in. And that's that's where I know that we're going to stay with that early detection. So on the bottom, you see, see it, snap it, email it, and then you can squish it. When I was uh, at the state fair last two years, two or three years, um, uh, ABC, Channel 7, uh, Good Morning America, the New York Department of Agriculture, uh, they came out with this just huge ad campaign. I think so did you know, many of the other states on the East, East Coast. And it's amazing how many people were like, yeah, see it, squash it, or if you see it, kill it. And at that point, we did not have a positive confirmation. And without a positive confirmation, we couldn't do anything. We were just kind of sitting on the sidelines, you know, like, hold on, coach, you know, put me in, I'm ready to go. But until we got the, the, the positive yes, 
we weren't able to do much other than kind of look at where we could we could monitor. Um, so I encourage everybody. I'm like, if you are in Illinois and you see something suspicious, please take a picture of it and please email it to lanternfly at illinois.edu. Uh, the reporting protocols, this was given to me by Kelly Estes. Thank you, Kelly, for sharing all of your information. Greatly appreciate it. Because it's so tropical, look over on the left-hand side. I mean, you don't see pests like that. Generally, if anything looks that tropical, it doesn't belong in Illinois. Um, but I think because they're an aggregator, because there could be thousands of them, we did not want to inundate uh, University of Illinois Extension Plant Clinic or, the, or University of Illinois Plant Clinic and other um, uh, labs with a lot of samples. Uh, I, I think that there was a, a good decision made um, that the Department of Agriculture said, hey, if you take a picture of it and you send it to us, we'll verify it and that's great. And I think that they are asking for county level verification. So right now we know Cook County is verified. I personally, Still want to know where it is, even though we got a positive confirmation. But outside of Cook County, we're looking at documenting the spread of spotted lanternfly in Illinois. It's not like Asian longhorn beetle, or it's not like emerald ash borer, especially at EAB. It's not like EAB. EAB flies to that ash tree, and they'll fly anywhere they can. Spotted lanternfly is a lazy pest. They're like, meh, we'll take anything. You know what? Got something? Good. We're good. They don't want to move. They're very heavy. The females get really big. Uh, when they're honey basket, that yellow and white, they get very big and she just doesn't want to go anywhere. So the best thing that you can do is to report it where or who, lanternfly at illinois.edu. If we were together, I would have given you your own spotted lanternfly scraper card. Erin, when we see each other next, I'll make sure that you have a stash of them and that hopefully we can hand them out. And we want you to take a photo, take a good photo uh, the photos that you see over on the lower left-hand side, we can pretty much tell that that is spotted lanternfly-ish, probably, uh, based on kind of the markings on the wings. Over on the right-hand side, better, seeing more of the pest. Uh, I think that that's uh, super important. Also, give us details. Let us know where you are. Where, where are you? What county are you in? You don't have to give us your home address, uh, but just like, you're in the county, you are next to a rail yard, and you found this, or you found many of them. Take a couple pictures and send it. We'd rather have too many photos than not enough. So it's really super important for us to, to get this level of documentation. Lanternfly at illinois.edu is um, an email address, and it actually goes to four or five different agencies within the state. So as soon as you send it in, it is a high priority. You will get a response. You will get, you know, most likely a follow-up email. Uh, and then, you know, if there's, a, if it necessitates a visit, a visit. Uh, but we definitely want to know. Kelly, I believe, uh, as our CAPS coordinator, is creating uh, a map uh, so that we know exactly kind of where it is and, and potentially what industry is located around it so that we can tailor our education and outreach materials specifically to that location. There it is, spotted lantern black card. Winter work, this is where we all get to get out. Oh my goodness, except early next week. If you're in Northern Illinois, boy, is it gonna be chilly. <laughs> like, my goodness, like I think it's gonna be like zero or one out. But anyway, um, this is a picture that I took. Uh, when I went down into Chicago, and it was uh, by Fuller Park. I think it's on the south side, if you are familiar where, with the White Sox and the stadium where that is. It's kind of around that area. There's a huge rail yard, a huge rail yard. And I went down, and I was amazed, to be honest with you, because this is pretty fresh. Uh, and there's not a lot of them, but it's pretty fresh. And it's purple. It's kind of a purpley pink. So that you can see, if you look at it really closely, you can start to see those little sausage links that are all put together. And then you can see how she just goes back and forth and lays this waxy coating, almost like a car wash, you know, put the wax over it, protect it. And that's how they overwinter in the state of Illinois. Again, 
these are pictures that we took. And what's interesting, if I were to cut out probably a third of them. So when we got there this summer, we saw probably three or four in this, in this kind of nook on the side of this building. And interestingly enough, this building is not on the side of the rail yard. It's actually protected over in this just really dodgy area. And um, there's a lot of tree of heaven and a lot of grapevines and things like that. Um, but you're seeing sort of the exponential growth in the amount of egg masses. So I thought that that was very important. It oftentimes, if you looked at it, you'd be like, huh, what's that? I don't know. And then you keep going. But definitely, if you see something like that, get up and get a close inspection. That is a last year. So you're starting to see how it's dried out and you're starting to see those sausage links. Um, that means that, you know, not all, she didn't, she wasn't able to protect all of the eggs. And I would say that that probably happened a lot. We didn't, I mean, there were some that were all protected, but there were some of them that, that just didn't, it didn't cover the whole thing. Anyway, enough of that. Um, so fascinating. This is Tree of Heaven. I will be going down and I'll be documenting it. But this is what I want, pardon me, this is what I want you to be looking at. I want you to look for egg masses. And if you see something, take a picture of it, email it to lanternfly at illinois.edu, and then take a scraper card, take a squeegee. I think a squeegee is like such a great thing. I put it on my backpack. I always walk around with a squeegee. It looks like I'm going to take a shower at any moment. You know? <laughs> like, why do you have a squeegee? I have a squeegee so that I can get and I can scrape the material off. I don't want people to go out with like pole saw or something that has a sharp edge because the last thing we want to do is start opening up the bark and certainly during the winter because the risk of a frost crack or you know something happening in the spring is, is huge. So squeegee is pretty good. I like that. I use, you know, if I need to, I got my handy dandy scraper card and I just go in there and I scrape it off and I put it in a bag and I get rid of it or I squash it or, or they're when they're fresh, they can disintegrate pretty easily. People always ask this question, is there a natural predator? Well, there is. I don't know if we, we actually know what it is, but I don't know if any of you know, we probably do. Um, but the natural predator is praying mantis. I still can't figure that out. But um, over in Asia, praying mantis is pretty prevalent in urban areas and uh, they keep spotted lanternfly in check. And I think probably they get, may go after more of the, the younger instars, but praying mantis is a natural predator. There are, uh, Bavaria boxiana is a naturally occurring fungus that is somewhat effective in predating on uh, egg masses. Um, and kind of, I think the early, early NIMH stages, but I haven't had any recent updates for that. A lot of times our naturally occurring fungus uh, in woodland communities, uh, the effectiveness is directly linked to drought or pre heavy precipitation. So if you have flooding, uh, chances are you're wiping it out. If you have drought, it doesn't have enough um, moisture and nutrients in order to continue to grow and spread. So. Uh, praying mantis, it's a natural predator. Uh, we have some great online resources, so please uh, visit the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Uh, they have an updated website, so that's great. That happened uh, once we got a positive confirmation. Uh, we updated our Facebook page. We have 2.9 thousand, 2,900 2, followers, and I posted a a, a, a uh, I did a post on spotted lanternfly and it was shared like 742 times, which is exactly what we want. It's that ripple effect. So super good. If you are not familiar with our page, go to it. It's Illinois Invasive Species Awareness and Management. Like it, share it. We, uh, we definitely will be using that as a communication tool because it was very effective. We had a number of uh, 800 responses, I think, or maybe more. Um, not responses, but people that engaged with it within the first 48 hours. So it was much more effective than I thought. Uh, the Morton Arboretum has their plant clinic report, which is super important. They also, we also updated our spotted lanternfly 
page, so that's very, very important. Uh, you can look at esmap.com or es yeah, esmap.com or .org, and I think it's .org, and look at, go to Illinois and put in spotted lanternfly, and then you can see the actual location of uh, the pest infestation, and uh, we will be using esmap. Uh, specifically for that, to document the spread so that we have that information available to anybody, anybody who looks at it. Just wanted to take some time to kind of talk a little bit about the Illinois Invasive Species Council. Um, when I talked a little bit about what happened, right, what happens in Illinois, what happens in Illinois is we get a pest infestation and the Department of Agriculture is the first line of defense meaning they go in, they look at it, they look at the assessments, and then they try to figure out, you know, sh should we declare it a nuisance? That happens at the state level. Uh, once it's declared a nuisance, then if necessary, our federal partners, USDA, APHIS, PPQ, um, potentially would come in and put in a quarantine if, if that was necessary, if there was something that would be affecting our food supply or any type of um, human harm, human health harm, uh, they would be able to put in uh, a quarantine to stop um, materials from coming into and out of an infested area. I'll be honest with you, I don't think that in Illinois, unless something really significant happens, um, uh, I don't think that, that that would be likely to happen. It's extremely expensive to put in a quarantine uh, in place. I'm not sure that that's an effective use of resources. Uh, the Illinois Invasive Species Council is an all volunteer board. So please go to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources under programs and under Invasive Species Council and you can get updates. We are drafting, we did, uh, Terrestrial did an assessment of Tree of Heaven. Hold on. And I think it might be under review. And then the pests and pathogens, Kelly, Assis, and I are uh, co-chairing that. We will be conducting uh, an assessment for spotted lanternfly. Our pest risk assessments are really for review, not for regulation, but for education, outreach, uh, communication. That's what the council is tasked with. So the council is really tasked with providing uh, up to the minute, you know, current, if you will, many organizations, a very diverse, transparent group uh, that is gathered from all taxa, many different universities, NGOs, uh, municipalities, state government, county government, you name it, uh, industry, green industry, big, big, big part of it, uh, fish and wildlife as well. Uh, so anyway. So just so that you know, this is a relatively new, it's been around for about you know, two years, two or three years, uh, but we're looking at, at how do we address pests that get it, come into Illinois and kind of where is that overarching communication tool? And the council will be one of them. Obviously extension is, a, is a, the number one partner, uh, but yeah. And our last thing, I said there was two missed messages, don't panic and whatever you do, don't move firewood. Help our trees, don't move firewood. Firewood is the number one way that these pests and pathogens move around the country and, and move around the state. Think about egg masses, think about firewood. Somebody's loading up firewood, they're not inspecting every piece of firewood, but if there's an egg mass on that, there's a you know firewood that's been laying around and she lays her eggs and then that firewood gets moved. You know, that's how this happens. So. Definitely don't move firewood and don't panic about spotted lanternfly because now you know how to identify it. You know what to do when you see it. You know how to report it and you know how to talk to people about it. So please do me that favor. And this weekend and the days and months to come, talk to people about it. See if they've seen and then help them advocate not only for themselves, but their community. Uh, because this pest, because it is a, um, it is a sap feeder, it will not necessarily kill our trees. It will weaken them, it will stress them, but it will definitely impact our ability to recreate. If we get a huge population in one area, you're not gonna be able, it's like gypsy moth, you're not gonna be able to like sit on your picnic table and you know have lunch because there's gonna be a lot of honeydew. Oftentimes what you're gonna see too is that Indiana told us this, is that you're gonna see every type of 
B, wasp, you name it, before you're actually going to probably see spotted lanternfly because uh, that honeydew is a huge attractant uh, to many of our stinging pests. That is it. That is not me. Uh, one of our wonderful volunteers, Donna, came up to me and she said, I'm going to make you that costume. And I said to Donna, I would be happy to wear it. So hopefully the next time you see me out in public, uh, Donna and I may have had some luck in trying to figure out uh, how to get it or where to get it or how can I wear it. I don't know. It, it, uh, it was uh, uh, very kind of her, so I was surprised. And then the last slide is the next presentation. And Erin, I'm going to turn it over to you. It's going to look like a great one. Empower Illinois strategies to reduce nutrient pollution and protect waterways. Super important. But thank you all very much. I appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, I will stop my screen share and you can ask me any questions. <laughs>